uh, set the ground for some profitable discussions over lunch as well. And we have a lot more to go this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, after all, this is, in fact, of course, the Investment Summit. So where better to begin the afternoon with an assessment of where the opportunities lie in an unpredictable and volatile global market. Well, Ben Thompson will now be sitting down with BlackRock super investor, the chief investment officer of global fixed income at BlackRock, in fact. It's Rick Reader. So the ability to do that, create a lot of yield without a lot of volatility is something that people crave from the uh, both retail, model-driven and institutional. I think that you have an economy that's much more stable than people think. I think we're moderating from a period of, uh, of, of extraordinary growth. But India is a place, you know, I think it's going to be interesting going forward. Hear from super investor Rick Reader as he cuts through the complexities of global investments and strategic decision making. Discover the strategies that have propelled him to the forefront of the investment world and gain insight into a future rich with opportunity and growth. Please put your hands together to welcome him to the stage. Please welcome, ladies and gents, Rick Reader. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, all. Please, Rick. There's a lot more chairs on here than there were earlier. Um, Rick, grab a seat here in the middle with me. Um, so wonderful to see you. Thank you for being Thanks. in Mumbai with us. Um, and there's a lot for us to get through. Um, but I thought it'd be helpful, first of all, to get your assessment of where we are right now. Um, so much change, geopolitical, climate, tech. What is your priority and where do you see the risks right now? <laughs> so when you say, where are we right now? So it's my first time in India. <laughs> and uh, this has been the most extraordinary. So you talk about change in the world, technology change in the world, regional growth dispersion. Listen, I think the first thing you have to start with is about how the world is shifting in terms of where the balance of power is, where growth economically is, and where the investment opportunity is in the world. You know, I was talking about it um, the other day. I mean, I have to say, I've been, I've been here two days. I've run out of business cards. I think I have one left, so I now I have to leave. The, um, but I've never seen, I mean, the, the amount of uh, growth you're seeing here, the places where I think from an equity opportunity point of view here, Japan, US, because technology is shifting the world, the transformation of this economy to a digital economy. US, where we have the bulk of our equity investment, Technology is changing the world faster than people think. And, you know, people often say, you know, I get asked about, you know, is the, is the U.S. going in a recession? There's been this discussion. We're going to hard landing, soft landing. Actually, we're seeing a shift of economies to service-oriented economies that don't go in recession. It's actually extraordinary. You know, in 100 years in service-level economies, 100 years in the U.S. has only been 13 negative quarters. So you're going through a change where technology, where R&D is going in the world, and I think the growth, if you track where research and development in the world is going today, that's where you want to invest, here, United States. And you look at the big companies that are creating extraordinary top-line revenue growth, extraordinary earnings. It's all following the R&D. And so to me, that is the thing that I'm focused on more than anything else. I looked at a few of the notes that you wrote, and you said actually one of the ways that you can avoid um, recession is finding firms that are building out the world's digital infrastructure catering to a demographic evolution of an aging population and companies that have local supply chains. And that tells us a lot, doesn't it, about what's happened in recent years, about supply chain disruption, aging populations, struggling to find a workforce. All of those issues start to deliver structural change. And they've been brought about largely by the pandemic, but not only by the pandemic. So, boy, there's a bunch of things to talk about. First of all, when people say, what is the economy going to do and how it's going to grow? If you actually track what actually drives the economy more than anything else, over the intermediate term, it's demographics. Demographics drive. I always say what happens when you have monetary or fiscal policy, it takes you off the line of the, dem the demographic. But then you've got to come back to the line. So when you spend a tremendous amount on fiscal, et cetera, you've got to drag on the economy, you've got to get back to the line. Demographics, part of what we talk about here is extraordinary, drives the dichotomy of what's happening here versus China, the, the dichotomy of uh, Japan's demographics. So top line demographics. Second, immigration in the world 
and this is in the U.S., this is a big discussion around the election, is how is immigration going to play out? Just give you a good example of that. There have been 9 million people hired in the U.S. over the last three or four years. 111% have come from international. 111%. Immigration, how it shifts and how it changes, is having a huge impact on, uh, on how the economy is developing and so how that's going to happen in the world. Listen, I don't think there's enough people for the jobs available today in much of the world because you're seeing this transformation of economies. How immigration plays out is going to be a big factor in, uh, in where growth is going to be. We've not yet got our head around where the jobs of the future will come from. I think that's fair to say, isn't it? And, and these jobs require people to be training now for jobs that haven't even been invented yet. And that, I think, for a lot of firms is a real challenge, where that skill set will come from. I want to talk quickly about tech because it is a revolution. We're not overstating it when we say that the, technology, uh, the technological revolution that is coming will utterly change the way the world works. Do you think that we've quite got our head around the implications of that? So, you know, it's interesting. When people talk about inflation is going to be here over the next three to five years, and we're going to have sticky levels of inflation, I don't think you know, because I don't think you know how artificial intelligence is going to impact jobs. So I've seen a number of studies, which I am sympathetic to, that suggest that 35 to 65 percent of the jobs are either going to be augmented or eliminated by artificial intelligence. What's driving inflation in much of the world today is wages, because we just don't have enough people. So if you're going to, if you're going to take this, the workforce down a third to a half over the next number of years, it's going to have a huge impact on growth, inflation, and like you say, we're not certain what the jobs are going to be. I'll give you a, give you a really good example of something that I think is incredibly powerful. You take the U.S. economy, if you go back a hundred years or so, it was an agriculturally based economy. The average work week was 105 hours. The average work week today is 35 to 40 hours. The projections are by 2050, the average work week is going to be 15 hours. I'm looking forward to that today, by the way, but the average, I, I, I'm, still in the, I'm still in the 100 hours, so I don't, I don't know when that's going to happen. Chance but, be a fine. Uh, so, but you think about what does it mean if you're going to have the average work week being 15 hours, efficient economies, large levels of social assistance, very different worlds than we're operating in today. And you know, you're seeing these economies. What I think is so fascinating, how things, cultural dynamics are shifting alongside of that. For years, goods-oriented economies, purchases of goods, now service-oriented economies, experiences. You know, a lot of this, I mean, we're, over the next five to 10 to 20 years, you're gonna see employment change, you're gonna see cultural change. And I think it's pretty exciting. But part of why it's fun being, I've said investing is the most dynamic business in the world. And, inter and trying to interpret and anticipate these things, I think is gonna be incredibly exciting in the next few years. You talk quickly about social um, subsidies, how people will be supported if they're working a 15 hour work week. What will that look like? So it's hard, so it's hard to say. And by the way, it's gonna be very different globally you know, as you look at the emerging markets, some of the emerging markets that are still commodity-oriented, heavy industry, manufacturing-oriented, that's going to be a much slower transformation. You look at, I mean, look at, at this country in terms of digital evolution that's happening faster, you know, you're going to see things that are going to evolve quite quickly. I mean, I, I think, and I know the U.S. Better than, uh, better than other places, I think you're going to see significant amounts of, of social assistance around health care, around retirement planning, around a number of things that are going to, that are going to be very, very different in an economy where, um, where it's a much more technologically oriented, lower workforce. Um, you talked about the labor issue. You talked there about retirement planning as well. That is part of the problem, isn't it? To solve the current labor problem that a lot of organizations have, it's about trying to encourage older people out of retirement. So many people left the labor market during the pandemic. But with interest rates doing what they're doing, that's not an easy sell, is it? Persuading people to come back to work when actually they could just shove their cash in the bank and make 5%. How so, do you do that? So one of the things that people, I, th I think, have come to realize that when you put in this much fiscal and monetary policy and you create the elevation of markets and this wealth creation, you have this extraordinary level of retirement that had to be fulfilled. You look at some of the jobs Healthcare, education, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, hotels. You have an incredible departure from the workforce. I think it's very hard. The one thing that is happening today that I don't think people talk about that's pretty incredible, work from home 
has created. So you think about work from home, during COVID, it spiked to 70%. Mm -hmm. It's now, the US data, it's now about 29% work from home. What's happened is it's now brought women into the workforce in a much more aggressive way. So actually, the reason why the participation rate is growing is because work from home flexibility, particularly for females, has, in, has enhanced the size of the labor pool. So that, that's, been, that's been pretty powerful. And, uh, but, but in terms of enticing retirees, when you've got, and we can talk about this later, you can create income through fixed income assets. You can create income of six, seven percent. That's a pretty healthy number for people that have retired. So I still think you'll see people stay generally in, the, in, in retirement. And talking of the policy response, that neatly gets us to, this end, uh, to the, the end of an era of record low interest rates, mm -hmm. uh, brought about, of course, by the financial crisis of 2008. We've had more than a decade of ultra low interest rates. Structurally, what does the response start to change, maybe in your mindset and that of your colleagues, about where the returns will be? Because it always used to be the case, wasn't it? Take more risk, get more return. That's not necessarily true anymore. So can I go back? 2021, in Europe, you had negative interest rates, which I think is one of the craziest inventions in the history of finance. So think about 85% of the funding of companies we were doing in the short end of the curve, five years and in, was at negative interest rates. I mean, it's almost bizarre to talk about it today. We're, we are literally lending money to companies and paying them for the ability to take our money. You think about how crazy that is. Now you talk about the converse today. Today, you can buy, particularly for US investor, I'm buying European investment grade companies swap back to dollars at five and a half, six percent. And by the way, these companies, when they were at negative rates, they turned their debt out. So they went, they took advantage of it. It's not like these companies, we kept going at companies and saying, you should issue, you should issue. They did. So they pushed their debt out to 10 year point to the 30 year point. Now they don't need the money, not nearly to the extent that they would have. So what's I think fascinating about investing today, and your point about you don't have to take that much risk relative to before, that same European investment that we, we were funding at negative interest rates, now we're buying at five and a half to 6%. At some point in the next couple of years, ECB is gonna drop rates, UK is gonna drop rates, and they're gonna be back to borrowing at 3%-ish. So today you can build a portfolio of equity and debt and you can clip investment grade, you can buy at five and a half to six, you take a little bit of high yield, a little bit of emerging markets, you can get your portfolio to 7%. That's pretty attractive. I and mean, we've, we've you know, for years thought of, if you can get equity return of 10 to 12, gosh, today we can talk about, I think growth in parts of the world in terms of equities, you can get higher levels, but augment it with income that is very different than we were for the last 10 years where you'd had to stretch to get, uh, to buy high yield assets at three and a half. I mean, Seven is a pretty good, uh, pretty good level. High yield at eight, eight, eight and a half, nine, depending on where you go in the world. And those record low interest rates spot this whole new range of alternatives and the higher yielding alternatives. And, and this gets us sort of neatly to the title of this session, which is there is a lot more choice as a result. Where do you sit on that scale? Because we say here, you know, are you spoiled for choice or is it just, uh, you know, an amazing variety of options that are now presented to you. I mean, where are you? Is it overwhelming, or is actually this a, a brilliant byproduct of what's gone on? I mean, I, you know, one man's opinion. I mean, I, you know, 10 years of struggling to find interest rates or products and fixed income that were reasonable. This is a golden age for us now. So you think about, if I took, depends on where you are in your stage of life, depending if you're pension, what, what type of business you're in. But if you create a portfolio today, 60% equities, 30% those higher yielding, fair, not say higher yielding, fixed income assets create six, seven, depending on where you are in the world, 10% alternatives. And boy, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity as well in terms of alternatives because of what's the evolution of the banking system and the ability to fund companies, real estate with real collateral, real cash flow sweeps, real structural enhancement. So building a portfolio of I'm going to own equities, and I think there are places I still think growth in the world is significant. To own equities, marry it to income, and then build some alternatives on it. You can create a, a much lower volatility portfolio than you have in the past and feel good about it. you're getting income and you're getting some growth attached to it. So it's a pretty good, you know, relative to where we were five years ago, 10 years ago, you can build a much more balanced portfolio. You say you look around the world and there are some countries that are much more attractive. Talk me through your thinking there. 
So the first thing is, I mean, I talked about R&D drives growth. Political regime, the environmental regime creates growth. So if you said to me today, pick, the, pick where in the world you want to invest in equity. I want to be in the US, I want to be here, I want to be in Japan, uh, where I see, you see the technology development, not just, by the way, not just pure technology, healthcare development, uh, parts of companies that use data effectively that are expanding their moat. Um, I think the next few years, you're gonna see companies that, you know, some of these bigger companies that, that, that exploit data effectively will expand their moat uh, relative to other businesses. So I like owning equity in those parts of the world. I like being a lender in places like Europe. Growth is slowing, interest rates have to come down, the financial system allows you to participate in a whole series of capital securities and other financial instruments. So I like to lend in the lower growth areas. The emerging markets, depends on there's some regional disposition around where do you go. I mean, today I, I like bar, actually borrowing in the emerging markets, or being, sorry, being a lender in the emerging markets, places like Brazil, uh, Mexico, Indonesia, particularly in local rates, A, because we think the currencies are gonna, are gonna perform, and B, because you get the yields are attractive, so. Well, that policy was more aggressive, wasn't it? I mean, raising rates much more quickly and keeping them out at that level. And now bringing them down. Yeah. I mean, places that, uh, I mean, you're seeing tangible improvements in inflation in parts of EM like places like Brazil, Mexico. And so we think rates will come down. And we think, by the way, we think the currencies will perform. Places like Mexico, which is an extraordinary beneficiary of nearshoring to the U.S. post the developments in China, um, that is an incredible story. I mean, you know, we've been riding the currency and we still ride the currency in Mexico. And so to be able to clip interest rate exposure and then ride the currency, everything is, is uh, still pretty attractive today. A couple of quick things on Europe, first of all. Um, it seems many economies in Europe teetering or in or very close to a recession. Uh, we are told it will be short and shallow. Um, but all the metrics are different this mm -hmm. time right now, aren't they? I'm um, thinking of things particularly like the labor market. But what is it that is kind of holding a big, deep recession away right now? So, listen, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I'll go back to this point. I show a chart. I just did a presentation where I showed, and I go back to this comment about R&D and you look about where open innovation takes place, and in Europe, the regulation is so intense that dulls the ability for real techno technological advancement that I think is creating a big drag on, on European growth and development. Obviously, you know, places like Germany, where you have the export mechanism to China that slowed, has also made it, uh, made it more difficult. And then some of the challenges, like you say, in labor and the higher cost of, of wages has, uh, has created some stress around, uh, around the economy generally in terms of corporate. So, listen, we think Europe is slowing. We think it will stabilize, but inflation is coming down. I do think the central bank needs to cut rates, mm -hmm. and I think they'll start doing that you know, closer to May, June, probably June. Um, but Europe is a, uh, you know, is a, what I think will be a slower growth, um, you know, not, not necessarily deep recession, but a uh, slower growth paradigm. Markets pricing in rate cuts quite soon, mm -hmm. uh, and a number getting us back to something um, a little bit more of the new normal. It's not normal, of course. Are they right? Given what we're seeing, will the rate cuts come as soon as the markets are expecting? So I think the markets were way ahead of themselves. Yeah. I think the, uh, you know, I've, I've, say I've sat on the Fed's advisory committee <laughs> for eight years and the Treasury, U.S. Treasury Borrowing Committee for five years. I think people think the, the central banks are clever institutions that are trying to trick you or say one thing and do something else. They were telling you we're not ready to cut. But the markets got so far ahead of it that I think was, uh, was clearly overzealous and you're backing up some of that. Listen, I think today service level inflation is very hard to bring down. Goods, goods are actually deflating, and it's similar to what they did for two decades prior. Goods inflation is, is coming down, actually deflating, but service level inflation is hard to bring down because there's some exogenous effects, the cost of healthcare, the cost of insurance, the cost of shelter, that just take years to bring it down. So if you're operating at the central bank, you've got goods deflation, cyclical, and then you've got service level inflation that's hard to bring down. What do you do with that? I don't think you have to wait till you get to the last mile of achieving your objective because interest rates are a very blunt tool today. When you keep them too high, you impact parts of the economy and not, not other parts of it. You hit poor people, you hit local banks, you hit uh, commercial real estate, residential real estate. And the way the economies are today, because of in a modern economy, 
big companies, tech companies don't borrow. So when you raise the interest rate, CapEx still happens. Com uh, people have locked in their mortgages at lower interest rates. You raise it, it doesn't really have an impact. They have to bring the rates down because you're too restrictive relative to where inflation is today. Even though you haven't perfectly achieved your mission, waiting too long, like you saw this you know, in the late 90s, 06, 07, waiting too long can be very dangerous. And uh, particularly if it hits things like residential real estate. Everything we've talked about so far today is a plan. It's probable things may transpire like this, bar any big shock. Uh, and what we know about this year is that it is an unprecedented year for global elections. I was just looking at the numbers. 64 countries plus the EU will go to the polls this year. That's 49% of the world's population. Um, therefore, I wonder what it means in terms of any sort of certainty about policy, who is in the big offices of the world, and what it means for risk in a year of such potential change. How do you view a year like 2024? So, you know, one thing I've learned about markets and investing is markets don't react to things until the shark is right next to the boat. And so, you know, one of the things we've learned about elections is predicting them and positioning for them. You can be really wrong based on polling. Yep. As you get closer to elections in, in whatever the region you're talking about, I think you're going to see some pretty impactful things that can change how you're investing in different assets, what regions you're investing in, how you think about, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this in the U.S. because we're going through what can be an extraordinary uh, election uh, this year. We have a big debt problem in the United States that I don't think anybody's going to solve, and I think we're going to see that come under tangible pressure in the next couple of years. What it means for trade, what it means for global geopolitical relationships is going to have a, a huge impact going forward. So I think as you get into the second half of, of this year in the U.S., I think you're going to see tangible volatility as people start thinking about how that changed. How do you invest in, uh, if you see a Donald Trump, you know, come more, much more to the fore, you know, how do you think about investing in the regions where he's been pretty pernicious in terms of his, uh, in terms of his view today? So, Listen, I think these uh, following these are going to be really important. But I, I find today that you have to invest relative to where you think the fundamental value is and then try to interpret how that environmental change is going to take place and then start hedging your position relative to that. Um, Rick, I really could talk to you all day. Uh, we've just scratched the surface. Um, I'm so sorry we can't have uh, more time to chat, but um, really, really useful basis for all of the conversations we're going to have on this stage this afternoon. Uh, Rick, thank you for being with Thanks us. Ladies and me. gents, Rick Reader, uh, BlackRock's Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income. Thank you. Thank you. It's really nice to see you. Thank, thank you. you.